Welcome to today's webinar, titled The Internationalization of Japanese Universities, hosted by the British Chamber of Commerce in Japan and iGraduate. This session is moderated by Vice President of the Chamber and Director of the University of Oxford Japan office, Alison Beale. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day to give a brief introduction, the Special Advisor to the President at Tohoku University, Professor Kazuko Sumimatsu. Thank you. I do a little bit of everything when it comes to international issues, and, and uh, but more on the education, education side, um, such as I help the university to develop um, international curriculum and um, try to help campus community to, to be more inclusive and international. So I'd like to share some um, slides. <laughs> uh, to begin. So, okay. 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 So, um, as a comprehensive national um, research first university, Tohoku University is known as an institution that is very strong in engineering and natural science. And uh, we have a long history of contributing to the society by creating innovations such as uh, what you are seeing on the screen right now. Um, well, before and even when I first came to the university about 17 years ago, my impression um, on in Tohoku University was like academically strong, but uh, very plain, conservative, rigid, uh, sort of like, uh, uh, I, I shouldn't say this, but outdated, <laughs> unsophisticated, ooh, harsh, right? And not international at all, okay? And um, then I started teaching and guess what kind of image I got from the Tohoku University students? Roll gemstones, <laughs> okay? Um, they're really smart, hardworking and academically high achieving students for sure. But some of them are very reserved, not open-minded, not communicative, and not international at all. And um, this is uh, where we are right now. Uh, well, uh, because we received high remarks on the interna internationalization effort, uh, thanks to the Times Higher Education Japan University ranking, um, we were ranked um, first in uh, uh, two years in a row and uh, which made us really proud of what we have done. And uh, we were also selected as one of the first three institutions with a designated university status. And I'm sure Sato-san from the MEX can explain it better, but this allows us to go beyond the structure of national university and then expand the scope of activities to become more internationally competitive. So we are very proud of this accomplishment as well. And campus is becoming culturally diverse and lots of international activities going on around um, all around the campus throughout the year. And we have very lively campus. Okay, so um, now we have a sparkling um, jewelries. Well, not quite yet. <laughs> we are on our way. Okay, we are, this is uh, the, the jewel is that we are hoping to get. We are almost there. So um, how, what helped us uh, change? What changed us? Um, it's a, a governmental funding for sure. Um, I'm sure Sato-san will uh, explain a little bit later, but uh, with a Global 30 project, we were able to develop many international undergraduate and graduate programs and we established overseas offices we, and we recruited international students, talented international students using this office. And we have international dorms where we intentionally mix international students and domestic students on, camp, on, on, on campus dorms. And with the selection of um, GGJ, Global Human Resource Development Project, we were able to increase the number of outgoing students. We were able to triple them actually. And we um, developed a global leadership program. It's a certificate program uh, across disciplines. And uh, we were able to internationalize curriculum, right? And 
and with a comprehensive topic, uh, topic global university project selection, we were able to uh, uh, you know, uh, organize uh, all of the past experiences and uh, uh, you know, go even further for in internationalization. So definitely this governmental funding has helped us uh, change in the past 10 years. So this is uh, what we are doing right now. We have um, uh, education, research, governance, and engagement deeply rooted in the university principles. And we are trying to get at uh, excellence and innovation and internationalization uh, really uh, spread through the whole uh, entire university activities. All right, thank you. Is that okay? <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. It must have been uh, very exciting for you to see uh, the development of uh, your university becoming so international. And um, um, just one question for you is, I think it's always difficult um, to kind of change the culture mm -hmm. of the university. So you've talked about the kind of um, um, systems that you had in place. Was it easy to bring everybody along and to really change the culture to become more international? And well, actually it took us about 10 years. We had to change little by little. And uh, with the governmental funding, we were able to uh, you know, invest on uh, teaching faculties and uh, uh, all kind of uh, you know, resources to internationalize the university, but it wasn't easy for us. Great, well, I look forward to hearing more about your journey over the course of this uh, mm -hmm. webinar. So um, now I'd like to move, I think maybe, is it about 2,000 kilometers south to another of uh, Japan's great uh, universities? And I'd like to ask Dr. Mi Misaki Takabayashi, who is Vice Dean of the Graduate School at Okinawa Institute of uh, Science and Technology. So Misaki, could you please uh, tell us about internationalization and what it means for, for your institution? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. Nice to be uh, spending the hour with you folks. Um, so Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology is almost the complete, complete opposite to um, how Kazuko Sensei introduced Tohoku University. Um, we only offer PhD degrees in science. Uh, so no undergraduate program, no masters, only in science. And we are only 10 years old uh, and um, internationalism is was actually part of the design in creating OIST. So there, there was a um, decision that was made to create OIST on the concept of internationalization. Um, so, you know, if uh, Tohoku University went through the journey of going to the diamond mine, finding the rough diamond and making a beautiful diamond ring, uh, we in a way began with the diamond ring. Um, and it sounds ideal, right? Um, but it's, it's um, because we did not go through the growing pains of becoming international, um, we have interesting, uh, we, we, you know, we are in a way an experiment of what it would look like it, um, after a complete internationalization or if um, none of that was to happen, if every university began as an international university, just to kind of, um, uh, uh, this is complete opposite of um, Kazuko Sensei too, but I just want to share one map uh, of how international OIST is, if you allow me. Um, the yellow highlighted parts of this global map are uh, where our students come from. We have students who uh, come from 45 nationalities at the moment. So, um, and including faculty and staff, uh, that number becomes more like 50 plus uh, countries represented in the OIST um, community. So it, it, internationalism, I hope means uh, increased diversity, right? So when we are all living in this petri dish of all countries, all many countries, and many languages, and many cultures, and many perspectives, and many uh, expected norms of operations and um, standards, and what's acceptable and what they hope for, uh, it's an interesting life. Um, 
However, I, I want to stress that we've been doing very well in, in terms of um, in, um, living in an international community. Our standard language of business is English. Our um, education is delivered in English. Um, so uh, I, I look forward to providing a little more insight through Q&A and Alison's uh, facilitation. Thank you uh, very much, Misaki. I think it's uh, really interesting to see a lot of our kind of universities have a kind of long history and have evolved to be uh, international. So it's yours is a really interesting case study to have started out as a as a kind of uh, being created to be an international um, organisation. So I think that's another really fantastic uh, perspective that we look forward to hearing more about. And um, now I think. Um, 9,000 kilometers <laughs> over to uh, Southampton and we're absolutely delighted to have them um, Professor Peter Smith who's the Pro Vice Chancellor for International Projects at um, the University of Southampton. Um, good morning Peter, I know it's the morning for you and we're really grateful to, for you to have got up for us this morning. So I was wondering if you could give us a, a bit of an introduction as to internationalization in Southampton and uh, maybe um, any kind of similarities or differences from what you've heard already from the two uh, uni Japanese universities who've spoken. Thank you, Alison, and um, good morning to all of the uh, all the all of the other panelists and the uh, and the audience, the participants. So I'm, as you said, Alison, I'm Peter Smith. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor International Projects at the University of Southampton. Um, if I just start off saying a little bit about Southampton for uh, any members of the audience who don't know about us. Um, we're one of the uh, Russell Group universities in the UK, so those are the research intensives. We're, particularly, we're located on the south coast of England um, in Southampton. Um, I think the most famous thing about Southampton is that the Titanic set off from Southampton. It actually also did the Mayflower. Um, but the, there's a strong maritime thread running through the institution. Um, and in particular, we, we're very big in areas around uh, marine maritime. We host the National Oceanographic Institute. So that's for the whole of the UK, all of the big research vessels. But predominantly, if we, as an institution, our biggest areas are in engineering. Um, and we're one of the big five in terms of UK engineering research. Um, just a, a few other sort of to, to, to sort of turn it to the international scale. Um, we're, we've got about 20 percent in every year of our under, of our um, student body is is international. Um, one shouldn't be competitive, but as Misaki was saying about the the number of uh, countries, I think our latest is 87 countries where we have staff or students from. But that's that's sort of because of scale of what what we do. Uh, we have we host one of the uh, Confucius Institutes funded by the uh, funded by China, so that that's a you know that's an important factor. But but if I think about the the sort of trajectory that we've been on. Um, I joined Southampton in 1994, uh, and we've expanded by around about a factor of two and a half in that time. But also the UK, UK higher education became hugely more um, internationalized, uh, really during the in the 1990s. And we now um, financially, um, international students particularly are very, very important to us. So something, the university uh, turnover is something like 100, uh, 600 million pounds. And about 100 million of that comes through international fees. So it's extremely important to us financially. Um, but also because we are very research engaged and we're very engaged in um, engineering research, it's very important for us to work with, with companies. And, and you know, if you look at the companies that work with universities, they tend to be the big multinationals. I mean, those are the ones. So we've got you know very strong links with companies like Rolls Royce. Uh, another one would be Lloyd's Register, and Lloyd's look after the insurance and certification of shipping. They they've got a technical services centre with the within the university in Southampton and one in Singapore. And so we're working with a lot of international organisations. Um, I think internationalisation is also very important for us educationally. And again, as I think uh, Mizaki said, obviously we conduct our education in English because we're, we're in the UK. Uh, and I think that's one of the big strengths that UK, one of the big advantages that UK universities have, but is also a disadvantage because many or most of our students don't speak other languages. So actually the, the incoming international students are very important to us in terms of internationalizing our curriculum. 
Um, we have um, quite a lot of activities overseas with teaching, so quite a lot of collaborative activity, a lot in Singapore, particularly with NTU. Um, but we also have a campus in Malaysia, so we have our own uh, campus there focusing on engineering. Um, I think from a, a research perspective, if I just move to that, internationalization is, is critically important. Um, you know, we have a, a very large number of collaborative projects. Often funding schemes are collaborative. Many of my colleagues in areas around, for example, social science work very much with developing parts of the world and other areas with other challenges. And really, when you look at um, the way we do scholarship, then um, everything's international. You know, international conferences are very highly regarded. We would normally, normal years, be traveling to those. Um, and if I think just about my corridor, I mean, I've got along my corridor, I've got Greeks, Russians, Indians, Italians. I mean, it's just just an incredible number. And we've got this very sort of, and I'm, I think we've become very used to this, very internationally diverse um, cohort of colleagues and students. And and that's very important to us because there's really a, a competition for global talent. And, and you know, it provides us with an environment which is very friendly and welcoming. Um, and that's very important because we have so many international staff. Um, and then I suppose the final part is we all are on a global um, reputational. So Southampton is 90th in the world in the QS rankings. And we're always about at about that point. Um, but it's very, very important to us in terms of recruiting staff, recruiting students, profile that, that we're seeing and we're, we're active internationally. So, so it's that reputational part is the, is, is, is the final thing. But just to, if you, if you give, forgive another moment or two, just to compare or contrast with the, the situation in, in, in Japanese universities, I, I don't think there's been much, I mean, I set aside, you know, the, we, the British Council does a fantastic job worldwide in, in you know, developing um, links for uh, UK education. Um, but there's not been sort of big government programs to really internationalize. It sort of happened and it sort of happened economically through the growth of international students. Um, but I think Southampton is representative of many other universities with having internationalization at the heart of our university strategy. Most universities have a, a pro vice chancellor international or, or similar uh, and, and really tasked with developing and building the international um, activities. So thank you, Alison. Great, and thank you, Peter. And it's really uh, great to have um, this perspective from the um, UK, uh, from a UK institution in today's um, discussion. And um, um, just um, to kind of touch on what you've just said, I'd just like to ask about um, post Brexit, because we're obviously we're here in, in Japan, and I think maybe some of our audience would like to hear, um, do you think that, um, Post Brexit, um, things have changed in how international UK universities are. That's a really good question. Of course, no, no one wants to hear the word Brexit, but it is, it is now a fact. We're, we're you know, we're, we're all accepting it. Um, I think that there are, um, there are opportunities within it. Um, the, the government has announced the Turing scheme for sending students uh, and funding students to go overseas, and in a way, it, we've moved from the you know, strong focus on the European Union countries in terms of student exchange, and we can now look to send, you know, many students further afield. So I think there are some advantages. Um, we've also got some advantages now. It's easier for us to bring, it creates in a sense a level playing field and the government have slightly made it easier for us to recruit staff with uh, PhDs, for example. So recruiting at the postdoctoral researcher level will become easier. Um, so, so to some extent, there's an opportunity there. I think with Brexit is coming flows of um, talent. Um, so, for example, with with um, government announcements about, for example, the passport status of people from Hong Kong, we can expect to see rather more students coming in from from those areas. But we do get a lot of, UK, of EU students, and there's been a sudden and, and dramatic increase in the fee level for internet for, for you know previously EU students could come and they were essentially paid the same or even sometimes less than UK students. And now they are the same as other international students. And so in my own department, which is electronics and computer science, we are we're, we're, we're advantaged by being top of the league tables in the um, undergraduate level. And we do historically get about 25% of our intake would be from Europe. And we don't really know how that's going to play because the fee levels have, have moved from 
essentially 9,000 to 23,000. Um, we are still getting applicants, and I think it, it's it's often the case that the students we recruit are reasonably wealthy backgrounds, and if they've already been spend, sending their children or their, the young people to a private school costing thirty thousand pounds a year, as a, as a, as a, you know, at the age of eighteen, coming to us and paying twenty three thousand or whatever our fees are, isn't quite so dramatic. So I do think we'll continue to get students, but it does raise a whole question about a question about access and affordability and how we ensure that we continue to attract the right talent. Okay, well, thank you for, for that. And I, I was pleased to hear that um, some potentially positive um, outcomes. And I know that um, here at the British Chamber of Commerce, we've already been talking about the Turing scheme and how, um, if there are any possibilities for us to work to, um, to make use of this, uh, maybe more, more possibilities for working beyond Europe. So does that mean more possibilities for doing things here in Japan and providing more opportunities for, for exchange um, between UK universities and Japanese universities? So we're definitely um, looking at that. We have a little task force already uh, looking at that. So um, I'm uh, very good. pleased that you, you brought that up. Yes, um, I think just quickly on that, I think that those will evolve over time. We all universities put bids in and they tended to, I think many of us put bids in with existing partners. So um, I'm sure that that Turing scheme will develop and will result in far greater links over coming years as we begin to see what's successful and what works well. Thank you. So um, we're moving on now to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> and um, I'm very um, pleased that our next speaker is Guy Perring, who's a regional director of iGraduate Asia. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to iGraduate also for proposing um, this session, and they've really been the kind of force that brought us all to together for this important session. So thank you, um, Guy. So could I please um, turn over to you and ask you to talk about um, iGraduate and, and any insights that you have had in terms of recruitment of international students? Sure. Thanks, Alison. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, as Alison mentioned, I come from a, a UK research company um, called iGraduate, which is very much focused on the international student experience. Um, over the last 15 years, um, we've been helping institutions improve the learning, the living and the support services for your students. Um, we do that by giving institutions comparative data on what their students are thinking and feeling about their current experience so that you can benchmark your performance in all aspects of the student uh, experience against your peers. Um, we've got data from over 3 million international students who've taken part in our signature survey uh, the International Student Barometer. And institutions like Oxford and Cambridge and Sydney and NUS used our data annually um, to get benchmark insights into what makes their students happy and satisfied. And indeed, how likely will they be to recommend their institution to their peers? And we know that this positive word of mouth um, about an institution and indeed a country um, is actually vital in ensuring international students continue to come to your shores. Um, I'm really passionate about the student voice and ensuring student views are included in government and international strategies and initiatives. Um, and it's great that we've got um, Elizabeth following, following me, I guess, in terms of talking about her student experience in, in Japan. Um, I think all institutions need to understand why students make that very tough decision to study overseas and also who influences that decision, be it parents, friends, teachers, or a combination of all of them. Um, I was looking at some of our global data this week in preparation for the webinar, um, and obviously looking at the current international student makeup in Japan. 80% um, of your students, I'm sure many of you know this already, but they're drawn from China, Vietnam, Nepal, South Korea, and Taiwan. Um, so, Proximity, of course, plays a key role, but we know from our global data that the key motivations to study at an institution overseas are the following. Number one is impact of the qualification on a future career. More and more students now are very much focused on future employability, and that's going to get stronger and stronger given the current economic circumstances. But they're also looking at both the reputation of the institution, which obviously Peter has mentioned already, and also the reputation of the, the, the countries, the countries it, 
itself in terms of its education system. And finally, and this has always been key throughout the 15 years we've been working in this field, is personal safety and security. And Japan is very lucky in that respect in that it's regarded as one of the safest student destinations um, by both parents and students alike. And even in the larger cities and the reputation of its education system and institution remains high globally. Um, but I do think institutions across Japan and indeed globally need to build future employability into everything they do. Um, I would argue um, that, as I said, it's even more important now, given the current situation. And this would include careers advice from academics who are actually teaching the students. Um, it, it also includes a careers office that caters for international students, not as well as the, the local students, of course. Um, a relevant up-to-date curricula to a future global career, and also building in a range of in internship opportunities um, for international students, be they face-to-face -face or, or virtual. And indeed, virtual may be a more realistic um, approach to the world of work. We also, from the data, that the ability for students to be able to work part-time while studying and having the opportunity to work post-graduation is also a key motivation for certain nationalities. Um, this is to a large extent dependent on government policy, but certainly the UK has benefited enormously from clearer rules about post-graduation uh, work opportunities. And I've been urging governments across Asia um, who are looking to increase international student numbers to change some of their laws to allow this. Um, we're now in the midst of giving feedback to individual institutions globally. Um, I'm based in Kuala Lumpur, so I'm looking at institutions across, across Asia. Um, the results of the LACE barometer, which we ran at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. Of course, the shift online has been the biggest change. And although international students are clearly appreciative of the efforts institutions have had, have had to make to shift to online so quickly, they do really want to get back to their campuses and take advantage of all the excellent facilities that have been invested in over the last few years. Um, we at iGraduate feel that we know what students value. And for them, that overseas, overseas student experience is about networking for the future, meeting new friends from other countries and meeting friends from the home host country. And we know that this social aspect of study has been very difficult to replicate online. Um, I know we'll touch on the pandemic later, but I, I think whatever changes happen, um, what shouldn't change is listening to the student voice. And I think one key part of the internationalization of Japanese universities is ensuring a diverse mix of international students and indeed staff on your campuses. That diversity is not just beneficial to your local students, but also to your local communities in building mutual understanding. And I think you can only achieve that if you're delighting the international students who are currently there so that they will become active ambassadors, both for your institution and for Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. And that's a really impressive um, set of data that you have, I think. You said uh, three million students, so that must be very powerful. And I, um, I hope we can hear more of your insights into sure. what they want from um, international um, education. And um, can I just ask, um, however, how you find how how you find regional differences? Is there, do you find there's a lot of regional differences, for example, in students who choose Japan? Are they looking for different things from people who choose maybe the UK or the US or other parts of Asia. Do you have any insights as to any kind of regional characteristics of education? I think, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting that primarily, as I, as I said, that every international student is really looking to improve their career prospects. That's one of the key reasons. Um, um, I think it, it does vary across national, nationality to nationality. You know, we look at, I mentioned already, um, uh, the Nepalese students, and they're particularly, when they travel overseas, they're particularly looking for the opportunity to work part time. Um, some of them will not necessarily be able to afford to study without working part time. And also key um, is the ability to work after graduation. And that varies quite a lot from national, nationality to nationality. Um, we've seen the, the changes in Indian students as they, they move from Canada, from the UK to Australia, et cetera, as, law, as various laws changed to allow them to work after, after study. Hey, um, thank you, Guy. 
Um, I think you're absolutely right that it's vital to include the student voice in um, all of these discussions around um, higher education and the future of universities. And so th that's why we're really delighted to um, be able to welcome a current um, student, international student to Japan, um, Eliz Elizabeth Gamara, who's a PhD student at um, ICU, the International Christian University. So Elizabeth, can I kind of turn over to you and ask you um, about your um, your experience as an international student and maybe looking at listening, having listened to what Guy says, do, does what he say resonate with your own experience? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity of being here and everything Guy said resonated very, very much. And it's really wonderful that this um, panel even ha has a student voice. I think it speaks volumes about the importance that, that, that um, it is and putting, putting it into practice, right? So uh, yeah, my name is Elizabeth. I am a graduate student at ICU. Uh, people know it as a hospital, but, but it is the university in, in Tokyo. I was born in Peru and I was raised in the US and uh, had the opportunity to come to Japan actually through the Rotary International Peace World Peace Fellowship. Um, and ICU uh, holds the only peace center for graduate studies in the whole continent of Asia. So it was a very, very attractive choice and it has a wonderful historical significance as well. After World War II, established as an airplane factory and, and still stands now, the history is amazing. So um, that's how I arrived. And then I continued on with my research as a MEX fellow. So I'm very happy that uh, MEX is represented. I feel very, very grateful um, for the opportunity to continue in Japan and work on my studies. I think um, all the points that were raised are, are by everyone, um, especially guy, I think resonate because I think for me, internationalism uh, from a student perspective goes hand in hand with diversity, I think as, as it was uh, talked about before, but it's also the, the university's willingness to hold this space for students, right? For me, it means the ability yeah, to network, make friends, have conversations with people all over the world that have a bond with Japan. So uh, before coming to Japan, I thought it was uh, homogeneous and, and you could argue that it is in some ways, but after arriving and realizing in, in this particular space, you realize that you realize the diversity in Japan already, right? Um, so in ICU, for example, we have uh, returnees. So these are students who've lived in like four or five different countries growing up and now they're returning to Japan. Um, who've lived in Turkey, Spain, South Africa, and now coming here. And they hold a little bit of their identity in these places too. You meet people who are Hafus or identify as Hafus, right? So um, people who have one parent that is Japanese and the other from another community. And I've been able to, to tap into communities in, that are very strong with the Hispanic Latino community as well as the South Asian community, but also hold that Japanese perspective to them, right? Um, including people who identify as Nige or who's, who have ancestry, right? We have Brazil, Peru, who have a long uh, history with, um, with Japan, but in their grandparents are Japanese, but they've grown up in another country and, and now are coming back to reconnect with the roots, right? Um, and then you also get, you have the indigenous community in Japan and you have foreigners who've lived here all their lives in the American base, they've grown up here. So, so I'm just giving these, these little pockets of, of identities that I've had the opportunity to interact with and I, I feel very privileged to call my friends. And I think that embodies internationalism um, I think also what ICU does, which I think is really incredible, is it has these partnerships with a number of organizations where they're able to bring cohorts every year. So I'm able to meet uh, government official people who work for the government in Vietnam and China and Nepal and be in a classroom with them, as well as people who are peace fellows and have maybe 30, 20 years of experience who are already professionals, but entering a graduate program again. So I think this, is, this, is, this has been wonderful. And what I do see a challenge though, is so much internationalism could also bring click, clicks, right? The Chinese only talk to the Chinese, the Japanese are together, the Americans are hanging out with the Americans. But what I think that, and it's a reality, and, and I, it not, it's not all rosy, but I think language is a wonderful bridge uh, for this and really acknowledging the, the intersections of, of, of someone's identity is, is a great starting point for this too. Um, and, and when I think about international, yeah, internationalism, I also think it permits you to consistently rethink issues at a personal level, right? So when you're reading about something on a, on a textbook and you're reading about the history that Japan has had with Russia, and if you have somebody from Russia in the classroom or somebody who's had an experience with the country, it resonates so much differently. Right? It goes from the textbook to actual real life and somebody telling their story, their thoughts, 
And in the classroom or virtually now, it sticks with you a bit more. And those connections are able to, to go beyond just the class and really ask these critical questions that are often absent in a lot of uh, places where, where this isn't possible, right? And so uh, that's something that, that it resonated with me. And lastly, but not least, I think my everyday life with the pandemic has, has changed and now it's, it's all virtual, but still it's such an incredible opportunity because people are in their own countries facing these issues we're talking about and they can reflect upon it very critically and very innovatively. And so I've been able to continue fostering these relationships. My Japanese is getting better, hopefully. And so that, that's helped a little bit. I, I'm, I'm still trying my best to do it. Um, but these circles, I think, have, have permitted me to really appreciate um, the current diversity existing, but also the potential for more. Um, one activity that, for example, I am engaging now is uh, Rakugo. Rakugo has huge historical significance, and I'm able to perform it in Spanish, English, and Chotodake Nihongo. Um, but, but it's something that takes me beyond the class, and I'm still able to do it in some way. So that's a little bit about my experience. All the points that Guy raised were exactly what I had, but I had some points in my um, in, in uh, like in, in some notes that I did, but I think the, this, these are just some examples of the way I've been able to navigate that in Japan and I feel very, very happy. And going with the uh, metaphor of diamonds, I think we are, there are many diamonds, but it should be polished some more and we should look at it from different perspectives to continue valuing this some more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for bringing your very international perspective on this. And it's been really fascinating to hear um, about your um, experiences and um, one day I think all of us want to listen to your rakugo so <laughs> we look forward to being able to have the opportunity to, to hear that. Um, you mentioned uh, MEXT and we do have a great um, speaker from uh, MEXT who will be joining us very soon um, so um, in the meantime though, I'd like to stick with this uh, idea of um, students and what does internationalization uh, mean for, for students? You're absolutely right, um, Elizabeth, that they bring such a huge amount of richness to, um, to, the, um, to universities and to campus uh, life. Um, in Japan, there's a lot of talk about a global jinzai or global skills in uh, young people. So I'd like to um, focus on this theme um, for, um, for a minute and uh, maybe ask um, our panelists, um, when we talk about international skills or global jinzai, what exactly do we mean? What are the actual skills that we're looking to um, develop a, in young people? What, what from your institution are the sort of things or what are the sort of people that you want to be turning out into, the, into society, into, into the workplace? Um, I wonder if I could start maybe um, with um, Kazuko, would you like to take a stab at that question? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, maybe um, I can introduce um, some of uh, what we are doing. Um, as I mentioned, we have developed a, a Tohoku University Global Leader Program. It's a certificate program and we work on a certain competency, global competency, and then probably I can introduce some of those. So um, students uh, who sign up for this program, we have over 1,500 students sign up for these undergraduate students coming from 10 different disciplines or departments. They, um, they are in this program and they take classes designed to improve um, their communication skills, which also include language. And uh, uh, they have to take classes uh, related to international liberal arts. Um, and recently we have uh, more and more students are interested in taking SDGs related subjects. And um, also we have classes uh, designed to enhance their core um, which is like the willingness and the ability to take action. Right? So these classes or extra even extracurricular activities in uh, uh, are such as like a, a problem based learning or project based learning classes right and on top of these students have to study abroad at least once. Okay, and then um, they have to earn um, IELTS 6.5 level of um, English proficiency in order to complete the program. So these are the glo global competence um, that we like our students to develop. And we help them check their progresses and accomplishments in the, in, using portfolio. And in the end, they have to, um, uh, you know, present, they have to prove that they have attained the competencies. So, um, and then we actually try to cross-check with industries and, and society whether uh, our 
global companies has been really working, will be working in the real world. So we do a, a company survey and just to see um, whether our students are doing uh, okay or uh, we like to get some feedback from the companies in the society, um, you know, their expectation for us as well. So um, we actually have certain uh, global competence uh, scales and then they have to, uh, you know, check, but we try to assist them as much as possible. So these are the competence in the new sort, sort of global genzai competencies that we are looking at. That's um, very um, impressive. Um, in your introduction, you talked about um, how at the beginning you, you found it was not an international university, mm -hmm. and maybe some of your students were kind of rough diamonds. And is it, Tohoku has a, a massively great, good reputation. Um, so I can imagine that some of your, some students, some high school students, um, want to go to Tohoku. They don't necessarily want to be international. They want to maybe work domestically in the domestic market, maybe. Um, so to, to what extent do you kind of force your students to be international or, and what proportion of students are international or, or is it okay for you to be quite domestically focused if you're at your university? And um, actually our uh, main purpose to do this program, um, well actually uh, they don't have to be in your program, but we are really hoping that they take, take at least one of these classes. Um, throughout their undergraduate education because um, they don't have to necessarily, oh, I'm sorry, it's a, a music again. <laughs> I have to explain. But anyway, so um, they have to, um, you know, they don't have to necessarily work in global settings in the future, but since there's so many international people coming to Japan to work or to live or to study, they might be uh, living with the neighbors which are coming from international backgrounds, right? So um, it's not only like a job related, but we like the, to them to be uh, in, to have a global perspective. Great, thank you. Um, Misaki, you you talked earlier about how your university was a bit different because it was set up to be an international um, university. So. From your perspective and from your institution, what does international mean to, to, how do you develop these skills? What are the skills that you want to develop? Do students have them already or do you have to lead them to become more internationally? Yeah, so many things to discuss here, but I wanna talk about two different types of students that we have in our, um, at our university. So, 80% um, of our students come from outside of Japan, so they're, they're by definition international, but you know, ha having come from another country doesn't make you necessarily uh, multiculturally aware uh, instantly. Um, so swimming in this soup of global community at OIST uh, for five years at least gives you that training on the daily basis. Um, and um, in terms of, and, and then, but in, the interesting thing is that because um, many of them do not speak Japanese or at least business level Japanese when they graduate with a PhD, um, they have a hard time. Many of them want to stay in Japan and they have a PhD in science. They're very talented, but it's very difficult to connect them with a career. And um, Guy is absolutely right. People choose academic uh, opportunities to, to connect to a, a career that they, they want to end up with. And um, for example, we um, want to take our students to career fairs, but they're, you know, uh, they're very, none that I know of, um, no career fairs that are done in, in uh, English in Japan. Um, so that's a, like a pragmatic challenge that we have. Um, and um, so that, that's, that's, um, kind of going both ways, um, these companies, multinational companies do come to these career fairs and say, we want to recruit global talents, but they're saying this in Japanese at these career fairs in Japan. Um, so it, our students may be able to attend, but they, they, they miss out on the opportunity to be hired because they can't present themselves in Japanese. Uh, so that's one. And the uh, another um, 
population that I want to talk about, the other population that I want to talk about is the Japanese students who come to OIST. Um, they, some of them do choose to do a PhD at OIST, which is international as a stepping stone to going overseas, right? Um, so, and, and then in that training, the, the, if I were to choose one strength that they need to gain in, 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 in uh, order to become a, a international global asset for human resources is shift in how they view themselves that the at the gaining that oh i can do this right instead of kind of being timid and and humble and all of that but just recognizing their own strength and their own talents and their own capacity to say i can do this um so that's a uh, one thing that I would like all of our students to, to leave. Uh, I can do this, but with uh, willingness to listen to other people's perspectives and to be able to fit into uh, in the company's culture. Um, in, in that sense, though, uh, another thing that Guy said that resonated with me is creating opportunities for internships. I think that's a, 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 a immense opportunity for company and potential future employees to test the fit of the cultural fit um, of their um, partnership. And that's that's going to become more and more um, important for our international and domestic students. Great. Um, thank you. Um, we're really um, pleased that uh, we've got a speaker from next. Um, so before just before we turn over um, to our um, speaker, uh, from next. Um, I'd just like to give him a moment to catch his breath. So um, can I just um, ask Peter just to, uh, a few, for a few comments about, um, I mean, you talked in your introduction about how English language was maybe a disadvantage for um, British uh, students. So, so how do you, as a UK institution, how do you inculcate um, international skills, global talent skills in, in your domestic students uh, no th thank you very much for that Alison it's a it, it is a real issue I mean it's it's a huge advantage because obviously the education is in is in English I mean obviously uh, some students study languages as part of their degrees all students have access to free language lessons and many of them do pick up um, other languages although of course there's always the issue of some will do Japanese some would learn Mandarin some will do Spanish because it's not really clear what your what your best option is in terms of um, in terms of employability, but but I think there's a that as Mizaki said, it, it's about um, that awareness of sort of global awareness is another part of what's what's really critical, um, and I think it's it's sort of it's at a curriculum level. I mean, I think it's done. It's, it's certainly it's done. It's, it's largely done at departmental level. Um, and, and it's also about bringing in the, the sort of international diversity of staff and um, and students. So we get scholarship students, for example, coming in through things like Chevening. But also if we've got, and I think it is at about 20% of our staff are international, they're going to find that their lecturer is from Hungary or their lecturers from China or uh, and so on. Um, and so I think it's, it's part of that. You know, there's a sort of critical mass when you're sufficiently international as an organization, people just find themselves they find themselves in a soccer team playing with somebody from whichever country it is um, but having said that our particular our international office puts a lot of effort into creating um, activities both for the students from given countries so for example every year there's a welcome for all the students from latin america but also there are societies and there are societies with um for, for, you know for, from many different countries the other thing I'd say is that, that we're very much a research led institution and that comes back to, um, to again to one of the points that Mizaki said about uh, the way global scholarship occurs, you know, and in, in the case of OIST it's having students, um, you know, making the main business of the university in English. So we put a lot of effort into getting students all over the world around, for example, academic writing and writing papers. And that's one of one of the big things and actually. What I'd say is that the, the domestic students have just as many difficulties in learning how to construct good academic papers as as, as the international students do. And it, it, it's a real focus of the, the, the sort of postgrad, um, so 
postgrad taught or particularly at postgrad research is that whole thing about academic English and understanding how to work within that that academic community. Um, but then just to pick up on, and it was it was it again was uh, Mizaki and, and Guy mentioned it about employability. That is a continuing challenge because um, if you you know for example in our computer science students, um, the biggest employer for them the biggest would be IBM in India, and how do you match those two up? And there are continuing challenges about how do multinational companies get those international students in. Guy, I'd actually like to pick up on, on, on um, this point uh, with you. I mean, you mentioned in the beginning that a lot of um, students from your data, you know that students are looking, they're seeing international education as a kind of qualification and they want a kind of qualification that will add to their employability. Do you think that students are also looking for to pick up skills as well, or is it the qualification that counts? And what are the skills that they're looking to pick up? Absolutely. They're, they're looking at um, employability skills. I also think they're looking at language skills to a large degree. A lot of them are not going to countries overseas with a um, you know, high level of English, for example. So they'll also be looking for levels of English. Um, when we look at global skills, we're always talking about flexibility and um, resilience, um, which I think what's been fascinating about this period is that students have really developed that, uh, that resilience and flexibility. So um, I, I can hope that answers your question. Um, but also, I think, you know, we mentioned already about internships, and I think that's vital that institutions are offering a range of internships, both uh, virtual and also, you know, face to face internships, increasingly virtual internships. Thank you. Um, we're really um, delighted today to have a very special um, speaker from the Ministry of Education. We've got um, Mr. Kuniaki Sato, who's director at the Office for International Planning at MET. So, perfectly placed to um, talk about this. Um, Kuni, we're really pleased to have you. Thank you for joining us. We've been hearing from um, various universities and we've heard about some how some of the MEX programs have really helped accelerate um, universities' international um, strategies and programs. So could I please turn over to you now to ask you about uh, what MEX is trying to do? What, what are your... What's MEC's um, aspirations for Japanese universities in this uh, area and what sort of strategies are you taking to support them? So uh, what we have been thinking in Japan is that uh, uh, internationalization is a very a key and uh, a very important factor for our Japanese university higher education, Japanese higher education to go for our future. Because uh, internationalization means very uh, huge to us. Because now, uh, as as you, we all know, no country can live uh, alone without linkage with international society. And uh, uh, talking about Japan itself, uh, we are facing uh, aging society. And so, in order to keep uh, kind of activate our uh, the not uh, only the economic activities but also the activities in our society. We really need to uh, be connected uh, with international society. Uh, and in the past, uh, when Japan has a very, very strong uh, economic power, uh, it was quite okay to go with uh, Japanese way. Uh, because, uh, but uh, now it seems that uh, we, we still have a very strong power and strong influence in international society. But uh, we need to be more uh, harmonized. We need to more ha uh, harmonize with the international society. Uh, that's our uh, idea. So, uh, in in the process of international uh, to promote internationalization, well, higher education plays a very very important and key role because uh, they do uh, education and also they do uh, research. And so, uh, the for higher education institutions uh, being more uh, harmonized with uh, international society. And uh, to get used to the internationalization itself is, is quite important. And, uh, but uh, if you see the kind of statistics, uh, when we talk about internationalization of higher education, if we question you know, how uh, the Japanese uh, higher education is internationalized, then we, I must say that uh, we are still on a, in a kind of, uh, I don't say beginning, but uh, it's uh, still I mean, we are on a road yet, and uh, we, we still have so long way to go. And, uh, and so uh, we actually studied uh, 
uh, various programs, uh, subsidy programs to support uh, universities to promote internationalization, starting from uh, Global 30. And Global 30 uh, focuses, focused on inbound of Japanese, uh, uh, I mean, international students uh, coming to Japan. And, uh, but it was only for five years uh, subsidy program. And then, uh, so, uh, so what happened in, like on campuses uh, at the uh, selected university was that they they did great job uh, in terms of the acceptance of international students, but it uh, the, the kind of the efforts were limited in that some some uh, like a school or faculty. Uh, so it, it's it's like a, in Japanese word we have dejima. Uh, it's it's a kind kind of a, a isolated island. So uh, so. Uh, Yes, uh, the internationalization was very promoted uh, so far uh, in these selected universities to a certain extent in kind of limited uh, organizations within universities, but not as a whole. But uh, when we talk about internationalization, uh, the, the, the internationalization as a whole is quite important. So uh, then what we did uh, is that now we started a top global university project. This is for 10 years, and uh, we are now in the seventh year. And uh, we've been kind of promoting, uh, actually, not only the uh, accepting uh, international students, but but actually the change system change uh, internally in university or change of the constitution of the university itself uh, to be more uh, uh, getting used to you know uh, the international uh, kind of ways to be compatible uh, internationally in order to be competitive internationally. So, so we selected 37 universities and uh, these universities uh, have actually 20% of the whole, stu all, uh, says all students of uh, university students uh, in Japan and 20% of the faculty members in Japan and 20% of the staff members in Japan. So that means that it's a kind of critical mass. So, so we, re we really, uh, uh, hope that these 37 selected universities for top global university project is going to uh, play very important role to to lead the internationalization of Japanese higher education so that's what we've been doing and uh, and so far uh, if you talk about the mobility of students uh, the inbound of the international students has increasing I mean I'm not talking about COVID-19 but uh, before COVID-19 the uh, in inbound of students has been increasing kept increasing and uh, the, it was uh, more than 300,000 which was a huge a big target for us and we actually uh, uh, made the goal uh, possible and also uh, the, for the outbound uh, the the number of Japanese students study abroad uh, based on the agreement with uh, university agreements uh, reached more than 100,000, which also which was very near close to our goal. And, and so, so it, it seems that uh, uh, in general, as a whole, the internationalization as its, as its, its system was quite uh, successful to a certain extent. But uh, as all we know that now COVID-19 has a huge impact, especially on the mobility of uh, not only students, but also the academic staff members. Uh, so uh, now we are kind of struggling, you know, how, how we are going to deal with it. Thank you. I think it's always, um, when we think about uh, the Japanese education sector and looking at particularly in comparison with the UK um, sector, I think it's always um, useful to kind of note that Kind of si difference in size in the number of universities. For the UK, we have um, 100 something um, universities, whereas in Japan, there's more like something up to 800, 700 exactly. to 800, 800. Uh, universities. Yep. So, so I guess what you're when you talk about the internationalization of universities is from Mech's point of view, are you looking primarily at this top layer, or do you think internationalization is also important for all the other? Um, 750 universities throughout well, Japan? I, well, I would say it's very important to all, not to only the top layer, but, uh, you know, our funding is quite limited. And of course, you know, in terms of the kind of regulation or standard or whatever rules, uh, uh, we, we try to approach uh, all the higher education institutions 
but uh, in terms of the uh, subsidy, uh, it's quite limited. So, so what we do is again that uh, select uh, kind of top layers and as a leading uh, institutions and uh, and and the, the mass of the uh, selected university is are you know as I said uh, it's a critical mass twenty percent of the Japanese uh, uh, composition. So so uh, yeah, I, I really hope that uh, these leading uh, institutions are, are playing uh, quite. Uh, efficient role to, to promote. But uh, one more thing that I didn't mention is that scholarship. Actually, it's a scholarship for both Japanese and uh, international students. And uh, in terms of the scholarships, go, that goes to each individual student. Uh, this is not limited to the top layers, but I mean, to whole uh, sector. So uh, having these kind of uh, students, uh, international students on campus and uh, having Japanese students experiencing a study abroad on campus is is going to help uh, for sure uh, to promote internationalization. I believe. Thank you. I have um, so many questions that have come out of all of that. Um, we've also got some really excellent um, questions coming in from um, the audience. So I'd like to just take a bit of time to go through um, some of those um, now. And uh, I, there's actually quite a few questions here for um, Elizabeth and um, questions particularly about the issue of language and um, how problematic, how have you found it as a Jap non-Japanese student about how, how, how much has language been a barrier um, in, the, in your, in your um, case? Um, uh, so this, that's a question from Melanie Chatfield. And I also have a question here from um, Tim Phelps, um, which is about um, the English level of teaching faculty in Japan. And the question is, are Japanese universities able to attract, attract high quality teaching staff who also have high level of English, especially um, in the context of not having so many Japanese students? So Elizabeth, could you kind of maybe kick up off um, answering Melanie's question about um, how you found language being a barrier? Maybe I could ask some of the um, other uh, universities, the Japanese universities, about um, attracting uh, teaching staff. Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you so much. I think language language is interesting, right? It's, it's very important. I think it's highly emphasized when you are thinking about whether you're going to stay in Japan or not or for opportunities. But I think language is only 50%. I, I really think culture is the other 50%. And it, it depends on what opportunities you're also seeking, right? So if you wanna go into education, people who are Japanese actually are, are happy when you don't speak at all, like a drop of Japanese because that forces them to speak English, right? And there are opportunities in that kind of hub, but other opportunities that might be outside of that, like talking to uh, Japanese customers um, or understanding the mentality a bit more does require Japanese. I think it depends on, on, on your kind of focus but I do think that there are so many channels that permit you to learn Japanese. Um, I think for my mentors that I've asked this question to who are in Japan, have been students and came with zero Japanese and can now speak fluently, they say, you really have to take it as, as a job, like really, really to, um, focus on your Japanese and, and, and develop it um, seriously. And there are many great opportunities, like for example, Middlebury has a program called the Peace Davis Fellows, and they bring they have over 100 scholarships for people around the world to study Japanese virtually. Next year, they'll bring them to Japan. The, the, the Peace Fellowship has a wonderful institute um, where Japanese is actually regarded as number one for their learning ability. So if you're able to find these channels, then I think it's, it's possible. Um, so in terms of that, so it is, it is, it is something you could say taihen, but definitely something that you can, um, that you can acquire. And, and on that topic, something I wanted to mention was um, there was a question about whether it's relevant and whether I'll be going back to the US or not. And I think that on the topic of Japanese, um, there are many great internships too. Uh, for example, like ICU has developed an MOU with the OECD uh, where basically they are able to recruit students from this university into these positions that are virtually, or you could go you, after the pandemic, you probably go, um, where you don't need Japanese, it's favored because the connection, but, but you don't necessarily need it. And, and you basically, I'm not saying you get to skip the line, but you definitely get to be in a pool of participants where, where they would really seriously consider you. So there are these little different hubs of opportunities for that. Um, but I see you, I think is, is doing a great job for, 
for for people who don't speak it. And I think that's also a challenge because if you're in an institution where they're just speaking English, then there are really few opportunities to practice that Japanese. And then it requires you to go and find friends, right, mentors, and, and force yourself to really engage in that mindset. But it is, again, the mentality, I think, comes before the language, in, in my opinion. Absolutely. Kazuko, um, how about this question of how easy um, is it to recruit uh, instructors or lecturers who can, um, who can speak good English and actually lecture effectively or teach effectively in English? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, well, I, I think this is one of the difficulties, not only like Tokyo University faces, but um, I'm sure other universities, this could apply to other uh, research first universities in Japan. Well, not always for sure, um, but our recruitment and screening are heavily uh, based on um, research accomplishments of candidates. So, uh, and then of course, not all of them um, necessarily have prior international experiences in education, right? So this is the struggle that we face. Um, and uh, well, we are trying to uh, incorporate new scheme like a cross appointment um, and then bring international faculty members um, as part of uh, our staff. And then they can just try and see how um, our university system works for them, right? And those kind of things. But uh, and also we all try to offer a variety of faculty and staff development uh, workshops and um, teaching resources as well. But um, those who try to grab these opportunities are not really our targets to begin with. So this is our struggle. Now I'd like to uh, see how um, other universities are doing to recruit uh, international faculty. I'm really curious. Yeah, it's a big topic. I mean, Misaki, m many of your faculty, I guess, are already um, non-Japanese, if I'm... Yeah, that's correct. A majority of our faculty are non-Japanese. That does not mean they speak English as their first language, uh, mind you. Um, so, yeah, and so our faculty are recruited on the merit of their scientific research, uh, first and foremost. Um, so they... Um, they have relatively low teaching load compared to perhaps to to Tohoku University and others, um, but the teaching um, class is one thing, but mentoring students and supervising PhD students in their lab is also their form of teaching. So in that sense, um, being able to support students learn is necessary. Um, as Elizabeth rightly points out, how much of that is completely dependent on language uh, is a big question, a, a variable, I think, uh, depending on the situation. You know, looking back in my own um, undergraduate years, my favorite person, a professor, was a Chinese professor. This is back in Australia. And his accent was really strong and I could barely understand him. However, I learned a lot from him. <laughs> and um, so, uh, and especially in science where so much of the learning is by doing, um, I think, um, you know, being able to connect with student, empathize with a student and help them learn um, is is key in uh, their their quality as an educator and researcher. Um, so uh, you know, yes, language is kind of a, a first line of communication. It's absolutely important, uh, but there's a lot more that's important. Absolutely. Um, Kuni, we've had a couple of questions that have come in um, relating to uh, your um, your your speech at the beginning and um, the questions are a little bit similar so there's um, Neris Reese has pointed out that uh, with the top global university it's um, the final evaluation is due in 2023 so um, what policy do you have any insight into what policies are going to follow up this program and Melanie um, Chatfield is has also asked a similar program so is there a further program in the pipeline to follow on from the current initiative do you have any insights or information that you can share with us about that? Well, it's quite a tough question. Uh, well, uh, nothing yet, I can tell you, because it's, we still have, well, two, three more three more years to go. 
So, uh, but I would say that uh, the 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 range of the 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 level of the internationalization uh, in Japanese higher education is still uh, on a way to go. So, uh, I really believe strongly believe that uh, we should uh, continue this some sort of like a a project to promote internationalization of Japanese higher education. So, but it actually it depends on the the budget of the national you know the national budget, and also I need to uh, negotiate with the Ministry of Finance, and I need to persuade quite many 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 uh, people who are those uh, uh, concerns. So, well, uh, but yeah, I believe that something we 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 need to come up with uh, a, uh, some some sort of like a project to to promote to push the back of the Japanese higher education. Oh, good luck with the negotiations and maybe in future we'll you'll come back and talk to us about um in a few years time about there any new programs that, that you're able if you to. if you can give me any advice uh about you know uh, any good idea uh, i would love to receive you know and listen to these uh voices thank you great <laughs> thank you i'd like to change tack a little bit um because uh, with the british chamber of commerce in japan so obviously we're looking at um uk and um, japan collaboration peter you've been involved and southampton has been involved with um Denke, which is a major um project to try and um, increase collaboration between uh, UK and Japanese universities and also industry. So can I just ask you a little bit about your experience as um, a university of working with uh, Japanese universities and why do you think it's important that UK and Japanese, British and Japanese universities collaborate together? Thank you, Alison. Yes. So um, my understanding, my my, my limited is, is Renke is Japanese for collaboration. And um, this is a, an organization that was set up uh, by two previous prime ministers. Um, and it contains a set of UK research intensive universities. And in Japan, it's Kyoto, Kyushu, Nagoya, Osaka, Risamaiken, and Tohoku, of course. And um, it, to me, this was, I, I represent, I'm the, the UK, rep, sorry, the Southampton representative on this, on this body. And it really is a fantastic way of getting together uh, and thinking about research collaborations. Um, the challenge is always there's relatively little funding and we have to try and leverage other, uh, other sources of funding. Um, but, but I think by bringing people together around themed programs, and currently we're, we've got a theme which is really looking around um, climate change. Um, and developing that, we'll be looking at um, uh, health as the next as the next topics. We try and coalesce around um, workshops and events. And, and really, what happens is is you bring people together around a theme, and then you're looking to sort of seed those those collaborations. I mean, I do think that there are there are two um, two factors which. We, we know we just did an evaluation of, of Renke with the British Council. And I think one of the really big things we've seen is um, over the last period, because we haven't been able to do face to face meetings, it, it is that much harder to set up and build, particularly new collaborations. Uh, you know, and and that, that's a very big factor. But for us, um, it's that ability to partner. So, for example, um, with Nagoya, we had a, a quite a big activity where they led, which was around aerospace engineering. And at the time, we brought quite a large delegation across from several several of the Renke partners, and they visited aerospace companies, and they went to BAE Systems, and they went to um, Lockheed Martin. So it was a really good way of sort of building up that 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 sort that three way because it is it is about um, industry as well. So yeah, I, I think it's it's been a really good initiative. I think it's a good prototype of how how these things can develop, um, but it does take a long time to build those to build those connections. You mentioned um, the problems of um, COVID, and I guess this is um, what, what people might call a big elephant in the room. <laughs> um, and I know many of us have uh, mentioned this is issue over the um, course of today's um, discussion. But um, in the last few minutes, I'd like to turn maybe and have a think about um, the future of the internationalization of universities both in the UK and Japan and specifically um, what impact will the pandemic have on on all of our plans I mean you've talked about the problems of um, meeting face to face a lot of internationalization um, involves 
people traveling and meeting up and making these connections. So in the, inter in the absence of this kind of international travel, is internationalization actually realistic? What's the, what's the future of, um, of, U of, inter of the internationalization of universities? And um, so maybe could I start by asking maybe from the Japan side, from, so from Japanese universities, um, what's the kind of mood or the feel about um, how COVID has changed things? Um, who, um, maybe Misaki, would you like to start? Any yes. thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, uh, I'll mute myself first. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, it post really pragmatic uh, 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 challenge here that is um, closure of the border, Japanese border. So d during COVID, we, if 80% of our students are from overseas, that meant that we could not bring 80% of our students into the country, right? Um, through an amazing feat of our staff's achievements, we actually were able to use a little window of time over um, the end of the year uh, when border opened up to quickly actually rush them all through. Uh, so we amazingly achieved at the largest cohort of students to begin during the pandemic, which is amazing, right? Um, so, but that made us realize that so much is of um, internationalization is hinged upon actually physically moving students from overseas to, to Japan. And it's like a atarimai, you know, it's it's obvious, but, you know, made us really feel that um, and made us realize at that time, this is something that Elizabeth said, and she's spot on about that. We have to, Japan has to realize of the our own potential that lives inside of Japan of talents who can bring international or diverse perspectives uh, to our conversations, our daily life, our educational system. And we need to actually put them in the forward in the spotlight and say, that's also Japanese. Right, people who come from different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds or mixed cultural backgrounds, that's also Japanese. We need to begin to embrace that as a nation to, to say, okay, um, because if Japan stays Japanese only or like traditional Japanese perspectives only, and we're just trying to add overseas people to, for us to become international, we will, Japan will never be truly international. So I think it's 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 it was a really a, a, an incredible reckoning time for us to be able to lean on existing uh, diverse uh, perspectives that live in Japan and, and um, in, embrace it and own it. Really interesting and insightful thoughts there. Um, Kazuko, do you have any anything to add from from your perspective in Tohoku? Yeah, and um, actually we have invested one year um, changing our system literally. Uh, we started, uh, we realized that we lose a great number of uh, international students, um, you know, physically on campus. So we started, uh, you know, thinking about bringing them into our campus online. So uh, we decided to change our internal system to so that we could bring the students, uh, we can, we could give student ID and in Tohoku University student email addresses so that they could use our uh, learning management system. So, and then we try to meet up with the student periodically outside the classroom to see how they are doing. So we are trying to replicate as much as possible what we, you know, we do, um, you know, if they are physically here. So, uh, and we had to do a lot of, uh, we had to go through a lot of changes and it was really amazing how much we have accomplished. And looking at the new normal um, coming up, I think we could actually do uh, that mixture of uh, what we have gained in this past experience is what, uh, you know, uh, we, I mean, didn't lose. So uh, we are kind of excited, uh, but this was a really big year for us. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Peter, how's the mood? I mean, in the, in the UK, you followed a different trajectory in terms of the, the pandemic and things are really seeming to open up a lot more in the UK now. 
compared to Japan, at least at the moment. So um, what's the mood in the UK um, with and in UK universities with regards to post COVID and what it will mean for the internationalization of universities? Thank you, Alison. That's a great question. And I, I can answer on behalf of the conversations in Southampton. Um, I mean, there's a great deal of that. There is a great national sense that we've, you know, there's been a very good vaccine rollout where things are really opening up um, next Monday is the start of the you know, sort of true reopening of, of indoor meeting people and restaurants and so on. And, and students being told they can all come back to university and have face to face. And so, but, but my personal sense is that we are still probably midway through this um, and certainly in terms of internationalization of universities so we are very much planning on a blended model for you know at least the next academic year where everything will be available online and particularly for international students recognizing that travel is going to be very difficult and and, and despite you know we have this so-called green list of countries in, in reality you know there's there's still great limitations um, on travel um, I do feel, and this is something, we're part of a network, uh, GFCC, which is a, has got a number of university partners, and there's a lot of thinking about where we are, and, and one of the strong sentences is we are still midway through this, and so um, there are going to be changes that come down the line, and there are going to be changes to the way students expect to, to learn. I mean, everyone's become so much more familiar with things like Zoom and Teams, that's sort of become the new normal, but but my final thoughts on it is 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 around the research side uh, and what i would what I, what is being termed the serendipity gap which is the the way we do research um is is very often we go to conferences we meet companies we have and it's often the chance conversations over coffee at some with someone at a conference or even at an airline at, at an airport where you realize there's an opportunity or this technology can fulfill this technology need and i think we're going to see some really big issues about um, how do we um, roll out and how do we develop technology and technology opportunities. And I think companies are often better at this because they have great clarity and they have a, a real commercial focus. I can see Mizaki nodding. I think, how do we do this in a, in a research terms? It, in a sense, it's easier educationally because there's a defined curriculum, there's a defined course, but how do you make the next research grants happen? And how do you get the next really big exciting breakthroughs and I, I don't think we've we've really addressed that uh, and if if the pandemic is over you know in 2021 then things are fine if it goes on a little longer then I think we we really need to address that serendipity gap and how do we get those 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 really powerful new collaborations happening really interesting thank you um Kuni um having listened to the three universities give their perspective on post um, COVID. I'd like to ask for what your view is. And, and you talked earlier about the importance, for example, of, of budget and the kind of fights you're gonna have to get um, budget for initiatives in the, in the future. And obviously I guess budgets are going to be quite constrained in the, in the coming years, I guess. So what, what are your views about how um, the pandemic will affect the future of internationalization of um, Japanese university or universities? Well, uh, Misaki mentioned a potential, and uh, I really believe that uh, this is going to be a very good chance for Japanese people to release our potential uh, by using these uh, difficulties. Well, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, is, of course, you know, uh, giving us a very a big hardship uh, in, in a variety of ways. But uh, we, we now in the government, we have been discussing, uh, you know, what we should do and uh, how our society should be uh, under and after COVID-19. And uh, the, the one key word that we have been, uh, I mean, I've been very uh, uh, appealed is like a diversity, diversified way. I mean, adjustment to diversified way. I mean, in, in terms of life or in terms of work or in terms of study or in terms of like a values, not limited to the diversified, uh, like a sex, sex, sex or uh, the, the age or the nationality, but the, the way of thinking or the, you know, in Japan, the, the, the academic uh, path or uh, the work path, uh, life path is, was, had been quite simple or single. But uh, now, you know, we, we can use online uh, and we can connect, uh, we can be connected world at any time and anywhere. And so, so the, the way of study could, could be much uh, different 
and uh, in, in including like a blended learning. And of course, you know, the face-to-face -face education is quite important, we believe, but uh, uh, online, if, if necessary, the online should be used. used. And so uh, that anyway, the diverse way is gonna be the very, very important. So changing our kind of value or the shift uh, uh, from one, one stick value to different, more uh, diversified mode is going to be very important. So in order to achieve so uh, achieve these things, uh, I, I think that the, the models uh, needs to be uh, changed, actually. Uh, for, for instance, for universities, like uh, the model of, for finance or a model for recruiting international students, but um, it could be domestic students, and also a model for the housing on campus, off-campus housing, a model for student services. And these models, needs to be now uh, uh, reconsidered uh, to be more resilient and to be more flexible, to be tolerant to the diversified way of life and way of thinking. So if so, I, I think that COVID-19 is gonna be a big chance actually for us to change uh, our kind of way of thinking and our value itself and, and release our potential uh, so, so then I would say that uh, you know we don't have to be that uh, this, uh, pessimistic, but you know we can be optimistic. Thank you. And um, this discussion has really flown past. I'd like to really thank everyone who submitted their questions, and I'm afraid we're not going to have the chance to um, cover um, everything. I am. We need to um, kind of um, draw to a close. But um, I think it's really interesting um, that with post-COVID, a number of you have mentioned big threats, but also a potential for COVID to be an agent of change. I'd like to just um, end up by giving a word to Guy and then finish off with uh, Elizabeth, because I think it's absolutely right that we leave um, the final um, word to a student and somebody who's going to be um, a representative of um, the future. So. Um, Guy, can I just ask you um, finally sure. in the last few minutes to give your thoughts on um, post-COVID and what it means for students? And then I'll, I'll turn over to Elizabeth to maybe give her final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of almost impossible to predict, but, you know, I was speaking yesterday to Chinese University of Hong Kong, who are part of uh, an organisation called the Asia Pacific Rim Universities, 47 universities, and they've got virtual exchange now across 47 of the institutions who across their 47 institutions, covering things like social and cultural and leadership initiatives. You know, they had some sake tasting in, in Japan. They had a tour, a virtual tour of Disneyland from a, their, their, their institution in California. So, um, and the great thing about that was that more, more students could participate in those activities. I don't think those will replace the real exchange that will begin uh, in the future. But certainly I think all these virtual tools that people have developed will Will continue and as Peter mentioned you know the future is going to be hybrid and hopefully internationalization will be available to to more people in different forms. Great thank you so again um, opportunities as well as well as um, challenges. So um, finally Elizabeth I don't want you to feel any pressure but I'm going to ask you to speak <laughs> on behalf of all the international students throughout the entire world and give your, your views on, on the future of um, universities and how, how, what, what you can see for the future. Yeah, no, no pressure at all. No, I do want to recognize that I'm only one person and, and I know that all, all my friends who, who have lived in Japan or who are students currently have different experiences. So, so definitely want to, want to acknowledge that. I just feel very, very inspired by everyone in this panel because hearing about the thoughts and the efforts towards internationalism in Japanese universities is, is, very, is, is very wonderful because these conversations, I think you, you don't find them, um, they're, they're not very common. You don't find them in a space like this. So definitely appreciate that. And as everybody was saying, I think Zoom definitely uh, provides limitations, but it provides so many different opportunities because now we can have guest lectures literally from all over the world. Um, obviously, the time zone is, is difficult sometimes, right? Waking up super early, going to bed super late, but you can literally hear the voices of people and communities that were once, uh, that you cannot hear at all, right? Because of the connections in the network, you can really see these voices stand out the most. And I think that's enriching for, for an education. 
I think just, just, to, just to finish my, my remarks, um, there's a beautiful quote that I like, which says, people won't remember what you said or did, but people will remember how you made them feel. And I think that really embodies internationalism because most of these students uh, come, with, come with a nice feeling afterwards. And then that provides an, a spirit of being an ambassador. Um, or, or ambassador often, I think ambassadors are looking out for their own interests and countries to some extent. So I wouldn't say ambassador, I would mo mostly say collaborative because um, these stakeholders that are able to provide a view into Japan to those who are interested a little bit more, right? So I think that is something that this university is striving to do and I'm very happy to be at, at this particular university, but I'm, I'm very sure that all of you in this panel are also doing that and are changing many lives. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's a really um, great way to, to end. So thank you for your final um, thoughts. Um, I'm really sorry that we have to wrap this up. We've already gone over a little bit, but I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the panelists. You've been really, really fantastic. I really appreciate the time of each and every one of you to um, contribute to this um, discussion. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to everyone in the audience and thank you to your one for your wonderful questions. Um, which we haven't unfortunately been able to get through all of them, but we, we value them um, very much. And um, at the British Chamber of Commerce, uh, we do have a lot of members who are related to the education sector. So uh, we have quite an active education group, and I hope that we will continue to be able to uh, meet together and talk about these really important um, issues that relate to education and relate to all of us as a society and the, the business world as well. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, thank you for such an a wonderful discussion and uh, so good evening and I hope uh, to see you all at something very soon. Thank you.